Yeah, that would be really cool. Yeah, that's and that's amazing to be like... so measurable as well. Mm. You don't expect there to be quite a large bulge. You're listening to the Cosmic Cast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Cosmic Cast. You're here with me, Tom Harvey. To my right, I have uh, Marissa Lowe. Hello. And a special guest, Ricky Bahir. Hi. And to my left, I have the ever beautiful Dr. John Pernet Fisher. How are well, you doing? Well, hello there. I'm pretty good. Thanks. Excellent. So today we are here to talk to Ricky predominantly in a strange twist of events because yeah. nothing that we've ever done before has yeah. been anything like that. As we mentioned the other week, you have submitted your PhD thesis and you have a viva planned for November. Is that yes. right? Yes. November the 13th. So what have you been doing to prepare, if anything? Well, just uh, really just making sure I'm stretched off properly, uh, warmed up. The body needs to warm up correctly before Over anyone does anything like yeah. this, really. And uh, reading through my dissertation yeah. numerous times. How many typos have you found? Oh, just uh, because I can't read correctly, I don't really know how many typos <laughs> there is. Uh, there are even. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well done. There could be numerous grammatical errors as well. But um, yeah. Many. I've noticed that some of my figure numbers are wrong and stuff like that, but it's bound to happen when you write something that's 300 pages long, you know. In a short amount of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, how long did it take me? Two weeks, was it? That I just plastered that all out. So, yeah. Was it not really? sort of more like six months? <sighs> two weeks, yeah, six months. They're basically the yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long does it take um, to make a baby? Two weeks. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We, we've spoken quite a lot about kind of tracking your progress towards the end of your PhD uh, but I don't think we've actually ever gone into anything that was more than a kind of cursory overview. Of what my PhD, of what, PhD Yeah, is exactly, about. of what, you're at, what the whole thing is about. So the title of my PhD was The Evolution of Martian Topography and Environment from Channel Networks. Mm -hmm. So what that means is uh, essentially anything that makes an incisional channel on the surface of Mars, I looked into. And that's where it started, but then we decided we need to focus this down into something that will give us more information about Mars as a planet in general. Mm -hmm. So saying, looking at lava channels wouldn't necessarily tell us a great deal about how the environment of Mars changed. So we narrowed that down to fluvial things and glacial things. And um, so the way it all started was essentially is looking at a load of images and identifying uh, fluvial and glacial channels mm -hmm. on the surface. So the way I did that was using what we call HRSC images, which are high resolution uh, stereo camera images. And they take images up to 15 to 25 meters per pixel. These are some of the best Close satellite to... images of, of Mars out there, aren't they? Well, so, that, um, so that's upon the Mars Reconnaissance and Orbiter. And that orbiter also takes uh, the highest resolution ones, which are called the high rise. Oh, images. sorry, high rise. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. high rise takes fifty centimeters per pixel. Yeah. Which is insane. That's better than Google Maps type yeah. images. I think uh, just um, for the listeners, a lot of those images are on Google Mars. Yes, if you want to check yeah. them out, so they're quite astounding. And I'm alright in thinking that you can basically just write a proposal to say point at this part of Mars, and and they'll take pictures of whatever you want, basically. Yeah, you're right, John. So uh, you do have to just send in a proposal. We were attempted to do it at one point because we found this area where there seemed to be what we call Elbestwerdale Crater, very difficult to pronounce. Uh, and within that crater, there was this amazing dendritic alluvial system. So wow. when we say alluvial, what we mean is you've got two types of channels on a planet, and those channels are bedrock or alluvial. Bedrock means that you've got water that just cuts straight into the rock itself and forms a channel. And alluvial means it's water that goes through unconsolidated material like sand. So when you think of your meandering channels on Earth, they're alluvial. Yeah. Whereas if you think of your streams you get in mountainous areas, mm -hmm. those are bedrock. Uh, and yeah. it, it does, it, they're important to decipher because the, the, the way that their geometries relate to the processes that form them differ. So if you look at something that's bedrock and you measure its length, that relationship with, say, for instance, rainfall is different than if you look at an alluvial system and go, okay, this is its length, and then how much rainfall do we think needed to form it? They're different things. So it is important that you decipher these two things. But anyway, we found this amazing uh, dendritic system, and uh, it turns out someone had already found it, obviously, as they do, and taken amazing images using the high-rise. 
and yeah so you can but that was one time we were tempted to um but yeah so i've got these amazing images of mars these 15 to 25 meter per pixel ones which are sufficient to identify channel networks because if you think about it the size of your channel it's only got to be just above 25 meters in mm. width for you to be able to see it in an image that is 15 to 25 meters yeah. per pixel so are these so, sort of comparable to channels on earth in size or well so as we went through this is that was more of like an end point of doing this so i, I mapped out loads of these channels mm. i mapped out um so i, d I went through 5200 images and mapped out 215,000 valleys that sounds quite time consuming it was very <laughs> so that was essentially the first year of my phd but what it was is it's like when you go onto a machine and you put your sample in and you get the data out you know how you do the a boop beep boop boop and then gives you all the <laughs> data this back. again do you remember that <laughs> yeah. do you remember how you just like SEM oh you just, <laughs> you just go in there and you just throw your sample in yeah. and you just go do the thing and then it gives you all the data and then you've got a phd for me and people like marissa we actually have to collect our own data and that was um so that was my first year of my PhD was mapping out the channels and getting the data from it. Um, yeah, for those who haven't gotten Ricky's thinly veiled grudge, I think he has a bit of a grudge against people who do experimental work. <laughs> Just a little bit. real science. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, so that was my first year was doing this map. And uh, Have you got it, good elevation models to go along with that yes. as well? Yes, so the whole of Mars has an elevation model. So an elevation model is essentially like a map but rather than being a visual map like you normally associate with maps it shows how high and low features are on a planet and a really simplistic way of thinking that they're made is essentially you've got this satellite going around a planet and it shoots a laser down and it records how long it takes for it to get back and if you do that over the whole of the surface of the planet you can basically figure out how high and low features are on that planet so that's a really simplistic way of thinking about it but that's essentially what it is and what we did with this map is, as I said, we first defined whether things were made by glaciers, were made by rivers, and the, it's it's quite complicated how we did that, but a, a simple way of thinking about it is, if something was formed by a river, we associate it with having a V-shaped cross-section, because on Earth, you get V-shaped valleys, and they are associated with rivers, whereas glaciers normally form a U-shaped cross-section, so you get U-shaped valleys with glaciers. And so I just assigned things that we had U-shaped cross-sections with glaciers, V-shaped with the uh, fluvial systems. So so presumably these are all river channels then that formed while Mars had a thicker atmosphere, and so therefore gravity more comparable to the Earth? Um, and, and how would that impact well, river morphology? That is a very good question, and that's not something is entirely known yet so in terms of the u versus v shaped the gravity shouldn't really make a difference there and um, the issue with mars is there's a loads of other things that occur that don't occur on earth such as things um like there's a thing called groundwater sapping and what that is is where you've got a valley that's initially formed by a a, a precipitation fed um fluvial activity so rainfall or snowfall that goes down and carves this V-shaped valley, but then you get water that then solidifies or goes into the bedrock that is available. And then for some reason, say a meteorite impact or something occurs and causes that then to release again. This is the groundwater zapping. It then carves away the, the, the V-shape of the valley, making mm -hmm. it look more U-shaped. So that doesn't really happen on Earth. Uh, in in the way we see it happen on mars at least but it's theorized that that could cause things to look more u-shaped even though it's still fluvial activity yeah. forming them so there are other factors that you've got to work into there as well i mean i um, suppose how, how well do you know the ages of all these rivers so that's another thing that's very difficult to work <laughs> out well i was just because... thinking because I, I guess if there were systematic changes with atmosphere mm -hmm. and gravity and all that you would see a, a marked change in how rivers the morphology of rivers and, and how they behave over time so very good question um the way obviously we work out the the ages of surface features on a planet is by doing crater counting so we look at how many craters there are per let's say square kilometer and you generally find that there is a denser amount of craters with older surfaces so the more craters there are within a certain square kilometer let's say you expect that to be an older surface but the issue with these fluvially formed features or glacially formed features are they're incisional 
So you could have a surface that is Noachian in age. So Noachian from Mars is 4.1 to 3.7 billion years old, but it could have formed yesterday just on a very old surface. So the majority of Mars actually is Noachian in age. So it's all very, very old material. Most of it is. So that's where more of the difficulty lies. And you can't just go, okay, there's a load of valleys in this old surface. So most of them then formed then. Because A, most of Mars is Noachian, so most of the surfaces are really, really old. And B, they could have formed later on just in a very old surface. Mm -hmm. So what we look at to really try and understand when Mars was more fluvial active, uh, active is look at surfaces that have um, hydrous minerals in them. So things like clays and sulfates, because those are on the surface so you know that they, they didn't come after something. They're, they're likely to be the age of the surface that they are. Mm -hmm. So the surface that has been impacted by the craters. And they generally seem to be about 3.7 billion years old. So that kind of implies that Mars was more volubly active around 3.7 billion years ago. And there seems to also be an overlap in having more dense valleys in surfaces that are about 3.7 billion years old or older than ones that are younger than that. So it does seem like that was the period in which Mars had an atmosphere that was more conducive to fluvial activity. Uh, how do we study these hydrous minerals? So once again, that is, is through satellite images. Sensing. So there's yeah. a thing called CRISM that is aboard, once again, the Mars um, Reconnaissance Orbiter. And I don't 100% understand how it works, but it essentially takes mineralogical maps of the surface. Mm -hmm. it's infrared. Yeah, I think it's an Im yeah, I think it's infrared. So it yeah. Uh, yeah, each mineral's got a unique signature in the infrared, so you can fire wavelengths at the surface, and you'll get a spectra back, which you can then tie to different mineral types. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's how we know the composition of the moon so well, mm -hmm. um, but. And, and how we can pair meteorites to launch locations from the moon, but obviously less so for Mars since mm. there's loads of sediment around. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and it, it's what they use, say, for instance, uh, they're using it for the ESA rover mission. Yeah. So they want to obviously figure out where to land, and then from landing, they want to know where they want to sample. Mm. So they want to look for things that might be evidence for life so you look at things where you're likely to have a lot of water so you're going to go for hydrous mineral areas and things like that so you look at chrism and go okay there seems to be clays around here let's send it over there to look for things so yeah so all these rivers and stuff mostly in the southern hemisphere they are largely so for people who don't know mars is split up into the southern highlands and the northern lowlands and this is a whole nother, you know, can of worms we could open. But this could be a whole other podcast episode. It could be, yeah. And I've only been paid for this one. So, <laughs> um, but so, yeah, the, the, the majority of them in the southern highlands. So when we're talking southern, we're actually talking below 40 degrees north, something like that. Um, so, yeah, below there, but also above 30 degrees south. So between that band of 40 degrees north, 30 degrees uh, south. Right, because you've got glaciers. Exactly. Polar regions, More so right. than that, you're getting your yeah. glacial features. And that's what we found when I was doing my mapping. Surprise, surprise, most of the U-shaped valleys are really southern. Yeah. And um, also what we found was that the majority of these U-shaped valleys form in surfaces that are in that transition period of people think of from the Noachian to Hesperian. So that 3.7 billion years uh, where we think the atmosphere was conducive for precipitation, mm. that was 3.7 billion years ago, and that's in between the Noachian and Hesperian. And then we found that the majority of the glaciers are just after that. So where you'd expect your atmosphere to be going from being warm and wet to going cold, and that's where you'd expect glaciers to be not so warm that they can't form, but it's not so cold that they wouldn't be able to uh, erode the surface. So quite so, the Goldilocks effect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what can the global distribution of these river channels tell you maybe about like the weather across Mars? Looking at the global distribution, you can relate it to things like, as John was saying about the elevation model, you can relate it to mm -hmm. where you'd expect precipitation to have occurred on Mars 3.7 billion years ago. Mm. And what actually is quite surprising is that our map and the previous map that was done by Heineck et al. in 2010 using lower resolution images, they found that the, the rivers don't match up with where you'd expect precipitation to occur. 
And there's a theory called true polar wonder. Mm. And what that is, is that people think that when the giant volcano on Mars formed the Tharsis Rise, it actually caused the whole planet's tilt to change. And that was during the period in which these valleys were forming. So where we're expecting them to form now isn't where they'd form anyway, because the planet's tilt was different during that time. So you spent the first year of your PhD making this big map of where all the river channels on Mars were. What did you do next? So using the topographic maps that are available, I produced maps of where we'd expect the slope direction to be now. So if you look at the topography, you can obviously work out which which is a downslope area and which are upslope areas. And that's an, all, an automated process. It was quite straightforward. Uh, but then what the, the purpose of that was is to compare it with the direction in the uh, the valleys are orientated because you expect water to flow down slope so when these valleys were forming they are relics of the down slope direction at that time so if we expect these things formed 3.7 billion years ago let's say for instance they should be in the direction of the slope 3.7 billion years ago so if we compare those we can find areas where the slope has actually changed now and that's what i did on this large scale and what we found was that around about 50% of them are still in the same direction, but that's still another 50% that have changed direction. Mm-hmm. And the reason that's important is because Mars is not any plate tectonics. So you're trying to understand what has happened to the surface of a planet which has no active plate tectonics. And we're not 100% sure why some of them are in the wrong direction now. I only looked at a few sample areas because there's so many Mm -hmm. and a lot of them are just due to cratering so you've got a cratering that has hit the surface after these things stopped flowing and that's now caused their orientation to not match the current slope direction because of the way that craters create like a rim they they mess with the topography yes yeah exactly so they pushed up the surface in one direction or they lowered it in another direction and that's caused them to no longer be in the same slope direction as they were when they formed but there's also this pattern we found that seems to be semi-global. So you've got this pattern of valleys that are not in the right direction. And that implies that there's been some kind of large change in surface. Hmm. Uh, and as I said, we're not saying this is definitely the case. But if Mars' uh, tilt did change at one time, and it was after these valleys had formed it would mean that the equator's position would change as well. Right. So the bulge of the planet would change because mm-hmm. the equator is actually a bulge around planets because moment of inertia and stuff like that, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would, that, that same thing would have happened to Mars. So that potentially could be the cause of this semi-global change in slope direction that has occurred. That would be really cool. Yeah. That's and it's amazing to be like... so measurable as well. Mm. You don't expect there to be quite a large bulge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i suppose for for people who might not like understand why that would happen it would be sort of like you know when spinning pizza dough or something and it spreads outwards mm. only you're doing that with a large kind of spheroid planet exactly so yeah if you switch the axis around which you're spinning mm. that kind of direction of stretching is going to change yeah yeah cool so that map i created which shows areas in which valleys are no longer following the slopes was quite important actually and at the time I didn't realize it but the reason it was important for my study is because obviously I wanted to relate these things to an environment at the time of valley formation and a lot of the equations that are used to do this require slope so if you're trying to understand um, say for instance discharge so discharge is a measurement of water flow down uh, an area of a channel you need to know what the channel slope is So if you're using the slope of a modified channel, it's no longer representative of what it was when it formed. So those calculations won't be correct. Your number you're going to get out at the end Mm -hmm. is not accurate in any way. So using this map, I could therefore identify channels which were representative of when they formed, the slope was at least, and then do discharge calculations on those. And two calculations which were of um, particular importance are a thing called Flint's Law and Hack's Law. And as I said at the time, I didn't realize this, but looking at the literature, people have had real difficulty of applying those laws to Mars. And it only clicked then that it was probably because they've been applying them to channels that are not representative of the time that they formed. Well done, Ricky. And you're the first person to notice this. Well, it's complete luck that I noticed it, (laughs) essentially. Um, But So I applied it to six channels 
uh, th uh, three of which I knew were discordant, so they weren't representative of the slope now and at the time that they formed, and three that were, and hey presto, the three that they were, were gave numbers that were accurate to what you'd expect in a terrestrial setting, and the three that weren't gave numbers outside of it. So that's kind of the hypothesis we had for the reason that these equations haven't been working in the past. And it's quite important because these two equations can tell you a huge amount about the um, uh, the climate and the processes that form the channels. Well, wh why haven't you submitted this to Nature then? Because <laughs> it's not a nature-worthy paper. But... <laughs> well, if you say it's got implications for global climate and all this, then yeah, yeah I reckon it well, probably is. These equations, aren't they universal for terrestrial rivers? Yes, yes, they are universal for terrestrial rivers, yeah. So... Essentially, yeah, the universal for Mars, we found, at least, from what we did. And um, that's not surprising because gravity doesn't go anywhere into those equations. So gravity shouldn't make a difference to them anyway. That's why we were really surprised we were finding all these literature saying it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Why is that not working? Yep. Um, so, yeah, that was a, it was a really cool surprise that we found. And, uh, it so when you, when, it, when you first observed this, was, was that quite the eureka moment? What did you do? What was your reaction? Well, you know how excited I get, John. I was like, cool. You know, that, <laughs> so, I mean, that yeah, sounds like the kind of excitement right that you off. might get from finding, you know, like a logarithmic mixing curve. Or mm -hmm. something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, nice. Nice callback there. For all the listeners, that was a callback. Yeah. If you don't know it, go listen to the episode. Yeah. Uh, it was Link on. Link in the description. Season yeah. two, episode one, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So yeah, that was really cool. So um, Hack's Law, for instance, just to, to give a brief summary of these two things, Hack's Law can tell you whether the river was likely formed by precipitation or not, which is obviously important because you want to know what the environment was like when these things formed. If it was precipitation fed, either snow or rainfall, that still tells you you had an atmosphere that was active. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Flint's Law one can actually do even better than that. Flint's Law can tell you about the duration of fluvial activity that formed these things. Um, so whether they were perennial systems, whether they were uh, ephemeral systems, or whether the, even whether the system seemed to form in an arid climate. So mm -hmm. they give you a lot of information. Uh, and although it gives you quantitative numbers that come out of it, these, imp uh, these inferences are obviously qualitative because you're just going, this is the number I expect for something that's formed in this kind of environment. But it's still super interesting and quite cool that it worked out that yeah, that's amazing. Mm. At yeah. uh, what point in your PhD did you reach this eureka moment? Asking uh, for a friend. <laughs> yeah, not that I'm waiting or anything. Um, when did the Hindenburg crash? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> uh, so probably by my third year. Yeah. Right, okay, okay. As I said, the map took me a whole year to do. And then I was processing all that data and doing the Valley Discordance map, figuring out that. And then... Yeah, yeah, it, it all came together quite quickly, really, to be honest with you. And then after that, I only did one last study, really, and that was to do with a thing called uh, the Darwin Crater on Mars. And Darwin Crater was an area that I'd identified when I made this map that seemed really interesting because you had all these valleys <laughs> that were were discordant around this one crater, but then you had valleys that were running into the crater that weren't discordant. Mm -hmm. So it implied that there were multiple fluvial processes that were occurring in this one area. Mm -hmm. And once again, it was that type of thing where, okay, I identified with a map. Um, let's look at it. Let's look at the literature and see if anything comes out of this. And after, after doing all these equations and everything on it, I've seemed to have found an area on Mars where you initially had these... Um, had an ice sheet, so everyone already knew that. They they assumed there's a thing called the Dorsa Argentinia formation in the southern hemisphere of Mars, where they think there was an ice sheet. And then that ice sheet started to melt and it released loads of water that formed these massive channels. And then this crater impacted, it caused the channel to become discordant. And then around about percent, potentially 1.4 billion years ago, there was snowfall in this crater that caused these channels to form that are now in there and I identified as concordant. And what's important about that is that Mars is thought to have lost its atmosphere about 3.5, 3.7 billion years ago. So it's quite interesting that we found these things that seem to be snow formed about 1.4 billion years and ago. And quite large scale things. They're not just local microclimates or anything. Well, potentially it's just a microclimate because you're not finding them anywhere else. I've not seen anything mm. else around there. Yeah. It's only on that Darwin crater, which is only a crater 
the top of my head, I think it's about 15 kilometers across. So it's not a huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still, yeah, it's still, where did this microclimate come from? What allowed there to be an atmosphere dense enough for precipitation of snow to form? Volcanism? Uh, potential volcanism. I did see some volcanoes quite close by. So obviously you spent the last three and a half years looking at Martian stuff. Obviously. But before that, your master's project was about the moon. Is that correct? We're going to go all the way back there. Well, no, I'm just I'm just interested because I was interested to ask what the switch between the two kind of subject areas mm. was like. Because from the sounds of it, they're quite different projects, very different bodies. Mm. So initially I was looking at lunar debris avalanches. Uh, so looking at avalanches on the moon. And I guess the overlap really is that both of these things required analysis of satellite images and data sets. Mm -hmm. So you give me images of the moon and you give me images of Mars, the techniques that go into actually analyzing those images is very similar. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the granular avalanche processes are very different than fluvial processes, yeah. but actually extracting that data in the first place, there's a huge amount of overlap there, really. Right. So it was the skill sets that came into it. And unfortunately, the time that I was applying for my PhD, it looked like uh, funding for lunar stuff was really going down, which has changed now, which is great. I mean, there seems to be a lot more uh, funding going towards trying to get more missions to the moon and things like that, which is great. But yeah, so at the time I thought, well, I don't know if this whole moon thing's going to last, you know, let's go towards Mars because people mm -hmm. seem to be saying that's a good thing to do. Whereas I went the other way for mm. my master's, I looked at Mars, whereas now for the PhD, I'm looking at the moon. Mm. So I guess it just goes in cycles and we must have caught it at different times. Yeah, yeah. But either way, it's an exciting time for both of us. It's, oh, yeah. mm. it's great that the funding's there for and both. And it's useful to have had some experience with both. Yeah, I'd say it's a very good thing. I guess it makes the skill set all the more transferable as well. Because mm. presumably you could then go and do, you know, other similar things on, on Earth as well. Well, yeah. If, if you yeah. know... You could, You're saying I could give up planetary science to become a terrestrial geologist? Well, you don't have to, but if you wanted to do like comparative planetology or something. Yeah. Or like look at dust samples that get caught in commercial jet engines. Yeah, something like something that. Something along like that, those yeah. lines. It's like transferable skill set. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Ricky, you obviously love Martian science now, mm -hmm. but if you could have gone down a different career path or different research path, what would you have done instead? So in terms of research, I'm I'm super happy with Martian research. As you all know, I actually am doing terrestrial stuff right now, uh, looking at commercial jet engines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was more to broaden my horizons with, um, you know, data processing, et cetera, and looking at different machinery and things, opening up my CV to more things. But that's not really my passion. Uh, so if I had to do something different than Martian research, I think I would. I'd love to do lunar again. I really do enjoy lunar research uh but outside of research probably um probably marlin fishing something like that oh, okay all right yeah, then are marlin you into your fishing, fishing? yeah I didn't i'm not know into you were fishing in... but it'd be so i'd want to do something completely different yeah so you thought you'd go for a skill that you don't have ant farming fishing ant farming yep ant farming okay yep. again is that a skill you have or did you just watch a youtube video you know, I've never seen a YouTube about video about ant by any chance. Um, right, thanks a lot, Ricky. Um, it was great to finally hear a lot more about your project. Um, and yeah, hopefully see you around again. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye.